I believe Outer Wilds is a huge metaphor that uses basic concepts of quantum physics to make a statement that we are able to live what Sartre called authentically by confronting our own mortality. And if nothing I just said makes any sense to you, don't worry, that's why this video is as long as it is. See, Outer Wilds ending is a bit weird. It's a long sequence of surprising and on the surface random events strung together. There is obviously a lot going on, but it is difficult to really put the finger onto the subtext. So when I sat down and started to write this retrospective, I set myself a simple goal. I wanted to figure out an interpretation of the end that I myself found logical and fitting. And this formidable, honest goal sent me down a pretty deep rabbit hole. I read tons of things about existentialism in the hot and coming medium of the 17th century in books. I watched countless hours of YouTube videos about the death of the universe. I listened to lectures about the nature of light. I had to dig up photographs of literal coffins I took in a royal crypt months ago. And I familiarized myself with the basic ideas of logotherapy. And after weeks of research, I finally came up with an interpretation of the ending that I find satisfying. An interpretation of the ending that carries a surprisingly beautiful and philosophical message about death, about freedom and about choice. In this video, we are going to dig up this message piece by piece. We will discuss the premise of Outer Wilds, recap its story and main mysteries, talk about the actual science that inspired some of the game's mechanics, have a chat about core ideas of existentialist philosophy, and in the end, we will hopefully combine all the different pieces into a cohesive whole that allows us to understand the message that is hidden within the subtext of Outer Wilds ending. But before we start, just two things. First, this video will not discuss the DLC. As far as I'm concerned, the DLC is a sequel within the game and deserves its own discussion at some point in the future. I do absolutely recommend playing it, however, if you're curious. Second, as for spoilers, due to the nature of this video, we're going to spoil the entire game. Like literally all of it, including the final boss fight. Don't worry, that is not the final boss fight in the background yet, that's just a random fish we encounter early on in the game. Alright, we got tons of things to discuss today, so let's get this thing going. My name is Sief, you're watching Sief Perspective, a place that hopes to give interesting perspective on great games. This is Outer Wilds. To await the end of the world, this is your fate. The game begins with us awakening. We play as Nameless Harfian, who just awoke on the calm planet Timberheart. And with this, we already arrived at the first and probably biggest controversy surrounding the game. A controversy so fierce it is still debated today, years after the release of the game. Is it called Timber Hearth or Timber Hearth? So there's a good argument to be made for both. Pronouncing it Hearth would make sense since, you know, Timber Hearth is a volcanic planet. The volcanic activity is what is causing the eruptions of the Geysirs. The image of a Hearth fits with the idea of the planet having stored immense heat below its surface. But it also makes sense to pronounce it Timber Hearth. See, Timber Earth is our starting planet. It is the place from which we start exploring space. Like Earth would be in real life. Pronouncing it Earth would mean we pronounce it like Earth with an H, which, you know, also kind of makes sense. So, which one is it? Well, scholars remain divided up to this day. We will call it Timber Hearth in this video. But just to be super clear here, if you insist on calling it Timber Hearth, your pronunciation is still very, very valid valid but wrong. So we awaken on Timber Hearth and with this we are already in full control of our character. Outer Wilds wastes almost no time to get us to the good stuff. The game leads us down a linear path through a small village with different tutorial hubs along the way. There is a miniature version of our ship that we can crash into a geese here in spectacular fashion. There is a zero gravity cave in which we can practice movement in space. A lovely Harfian who tells us everything we'll ever want to know about our camera probe. A kind of camera gun that allows us to shoot a little drone that can take take pictures in real time from wherever it landed. And there are even a bunch of kids that want to play hide and seek with us and introduce the signal scanning mechanic. And I absolutely love this tutorial. It does so many things on so many layers at once, yet it is so incredibly unintrusive. It establishes the Harfians. It is repeatable in case we missed something our first time through. It is skippable on repeat playthroughs. It familiarizes us with the layout of the village and it doesn't waste any time doing all of it. It's just a greatly designed, tight tutorial tutorial that works on several layers at once. It is a great blueprint on how to make an unobtrusive tutorial in general. I honestly hope the Pokemon franchise is currently taking notes. After a while, the path takes us behind this little waterfall. And this waterfall 
is really interesting. See, in my humble onion, Outer Wilds is built upon three main pillars that compromise most of its gameplay. And this waterfall here tells us a lot about one of those three core pillars. So what the fuzzy is so special about this falling water, one might ask. The beginning of Outer Wilds is really calm. The village is a peaceful and lovely place. The Harfians are all exceptionally nice and concerned with ordinary and innocent everyday things. The sun is shining, this calm music plays in the background, everything has this innocent and idyllic feeling to it while we explore. And then the road through the city leads us past the waterfall. And this changes for a moment. Here's a clip of what it sounds like to walk past this waterfall. Take a listen. Did you notice it? The ambient sound of the waterfall is incredibly loud, strong and forceful. That's no peaceful, idyllic waterfall sound. You can barely hear anything else when walking past the falling water, which, you know, is interesting. The entire setup here is this peaceful, idyllic village. But when we walk past the waterfall, they do not give us a calm sound effect of water flowing silently in the background, but a really loud and forceful sound that completely destroys the idyllic ambient that they were building up so carefully. Why would they do that? Which brings us to one of the core gameplay pillars of Outer Wilds. A huge part of Outer Wilds is about experiencing the sheer force and terror of nature. During our first playthrough of Outer Wilds, we are likely to die over and over again. Outer Wilds isn't a difficult game, but it is also no game that is afraid to kill us. The game, however, does not feature enemies, with just one noteworthy exception. Most of the time, when we die in Outer Wilds, it was a force of nature killing us. It might be a whirlwind that slings us into space, falling sand crushing us, us not surviving a terrible fall, a meteor hitting us while exploring, or us making a wrong step in darkness. While playing Outer Wilds, we really feel as if we were exploring a natural world that doesn't care about our presence. The game is even brave enough to feature complete darkness. When there is no natural light source in the game, the screen is black pitch black, no cheating, and the game often sends us into cave systems or ruins where we can see nothing outside our flashlight's little radius, as, you know, it would be if we were exploring a cave in the real world. The things that are inconvenient or dangerous in reality are still inconvenient or dangerous in Outer Wilds. Outer Wilds goes out of its way to give us the feeling that the environments don't care about our presence. And I believe this is also the reason why the sound effect of the waterfall in the village is so loud and forceful, because in Outer Wilds, the waterfall doesn't care that we are here, it doesn't care that we are in an idyllic village, and it doesn't care that it is so loud that we can barely hear the music anymore. Just like in nature, you know, the waterfall just is. As I see it, one of the core pillars of Outer Wilds is to experience the forces of nature in a game setting. In Outer Wilds, nature is indifferent to our presence. And in my opinion, this is one of the game's biggest strengths. But we were talking about the tutorial, weren't we? Um. Good tutorial. Here's a treat, have a pet on the back. At the end of the tutorial, we find the museum. The museum displays the precious discoveries of the Outer Wilds Venture, a space traveling program founded by four brave Harthians in the past. There are currently five members of the Outer Wilds Venture out there in space, namely Esker, Felspar, Rebek, Jerd and Gabro. Those five little astronauts are incredibly important to the game story. They are at the heart of Outer Wilds ending. More on them in a second. We are about to join them as a new astronaut in the space program. Our training is already complete and all that is left to do for us is to retrieve the launch codes for our spaceship, which we conveniently find in the museum. There are also a bunch of items on display that give us a tease on what's to come. A gravity crystal, the toys of gravitation, a cute little angular fish, a weird quantum stone that seems to shift its position around at random times, and old writings of the Nomai, an ancient race that went extinct long ago. We can even decipher the writings using a fancy translation tool. As we leave the museum, this suspicious statue at the entrance suddenly turns to us, lights up, and a weird sequence happens. Some of our memories are weirdly connected to the statue. It's going to take many hours of gameplay until we have only a remote idea of what was going on here. And with this, the introduction of Outer Wilds is already over. We enter the launch codes, hop into our ship, launch into the orbit for the very first time and... And... Well... 
have absolutely no idea of what to do and where to go. The beginning of Outer Wilds is very unusual. We launch our ship and have a literal universe to explore right in front of us, but barely any guidance of what to do or where to go. We don't even know the goal of the game yet. Outer Wilds is a video game that has us figure out the winning state by exploring it enough. Just to be clear, that's not a flaw of the game. It's a bit weird the first time through, but the game can't do it any other way because of its really unique premise and its unique approach to storytelling. The only guidance that the game gives us are five signals that we receive in a far distance. Those five signals are emitted from the five space traveling Harthians, we just waffled about before. So let's quickly talk about the five little guys and let's establish the different planets while doing so. The first one we are likely to encounter is Esker on the Etrolog. Timberharsh's moon. They are alone on the moon and seem to miss company a bit, but otherwise appear to be quite happy with being alone on the moon. The second Harfian is Rebek. We find them below the surface of the planet Brittle Hollow. Brittle Hollow is a really interesting and dangerous place. A volcanic moon orbits the planet, permanently spewing meteors towards the planet's brittle surface. Because of this, the surface of the planet is slowly breaking apart. At the center of the planet is a black hole. Every time a part of the planet breaks loose, it falls into the black hole, which teleports it to a faraway white hole. Rebek is interested in learning more about the past and the history of the planets. They came to Brittle Hollow to see the Hanging City, a city built by the long extinct Nomai race. Rebek sadly fell through a hole on the collapsing outside of the planet and is now too afraid to leave this place. They are an archaeologist with a great fondness for everything that happened in the past. So let's press the pause button here for a second. And let's talk about archaeology, the study of the recent human past through materials. See, archaeology is the second of the three core pillars on which Outer Wilds gameplay is built upon. Scattered over the different planets, there are ruins of the past civilizations of the Nomai. One by one, we discover those remains and slowly piece together the history of the extinct race. We visit their shrines, explore their ruins, decipher their writings, interact with their remaining technology and study their paintings. One of the core things that we do in Outer Wilds is actually the work of an archaeologist. The same way nature doesn't care about us in Outer Wilds, Else, the past doesn't care about us either. The things that happened in this universe happened long before we arrived. They are set in stone and all that we can do is learn about this past by studying seemingly random things the Nomai left behind. On Brittle Hollow they left behind a small settlement, a big city, huge mysterious machinery and a research laboratory among other things. On the Hourglass Twins they left behind another settlement. The Hourglass Twins are two binary planets that orbit each other. Connecting them is a gigantic moving pillar of sand that slowly transports the sand from one twin to the other. At the beginning, the ash twin is completely covered with sand and the amber twin completely hollow. But as the sand leaves the planet, the ash twin slowly reveals a gigantic Nomai built structure consisting of many towers and huge solar panels. The purpose of this construction is actually one of the game's biggest mysteries. The amber twin, however, is completely covered with sand by the end, flooding the entire sunless city that the Nomai built in the cave systems below. On the Amber Twin, we encounter Chert for the first time. Chert is a lovely little fellow. They really enjoy their work and are highly interested in science and in learning new things. They actually tell us that they sometimes feel like they are the only traveler interested in doing science at all. And they probably would be right about this if it weren't for us, the player character. Which brings us to the third and final pillar on which Outer Wilds gameplay is built upon, being a scientist. Let's for a second collectively pretend that actual scientific work only consists of innocently trying to understand and to manipulate nature's many mysteries. Here's a picture of an incredibly cute kitten to get everyone into the correct naive mindset. Excellent. So the work of a scientist is to try to observe nature's many mysteries without any form of preconceived notion. You know, scientists are only interested in finding out how the world truly works. There is an objective truth out there and science observes nature's mysteries with the goal of understanding those rules rules of existence. That's a romanticized idea of science. And that is exactly what the third pillar of Outer Wilds gameplay is. The same way that neither nature nor history care for us in Outer Wilds, the world follows a preconceived set of rules that is completely independent of us. And we have no idea about those rules. All that we can do is to observe the world around us, trying to understand the rules that the universe follows. The Hourglass Twins are a great example for this. When we first land on the surface of the Ash Twin and start 
to explore it. There is nothing there, it's just sand. But then suddenly the huge sand pillar forms and moves over the planet's surface, slinging everything it encounters towards its twin planet, including ourselves or our ship. Slowly we learn that this happens, we understand what is going on and finally find ways to use this phenomenon to our advantage by, for example, realizing that we can run over otherwise stingy cacti when the sand blows over them. You know, that's a micro example for us doing scientific research. The whole game is filled to the brim with phenomena like this. One of the main parts of Outer Wilds is just to observe and to slowly understand the rules upon which its world operates and, well, yeah, it's great. Outer Wilds is this wild cocktail mixed out of a brutal nature, the long lost history of an ancient civilization and predictable rules that cause the behavior of its planets. It's a terrifying mix that gives us this feeling of logical, cohesive world that we can slowly master, but that doesn't care about us in the slightest. So let's find the final two astronauts and establish the final two planets. Our next stop is Dark Bramble. Visiting Dark Bramble is quite the experience. I'd give it a Yelp review of only a single lonely star and a comment that just says, do not recommend going there, came here to eat, but got eaten instead. Dark Bramble used to be an ice planet at the far edge of the solar system until a mysterious seed from deep space hit it one day, long before even the Nomai arrived in the solar system. This seed grew into a strange plant, a plant capable of warping space and time itself. After a while, the plant's grip on the planet became so strong that it led to the collapse of the entire thing. Where once a frozen planet used to be, there are now twisted vines linked by glowing seed nodes that wrap and warp in itself in ways that are not explainable by normal physics. And I know what you're currently thinking. What are you waffling about Dark Bramble being terrifying? So far, this sounds amazing. And I'd agree with you, imaginary viewer, if it weren't for the locals. Because in the middle of Dark Bramble, terrifying anglerfish live. Anglerfish, whose light trap looks exactly the same as the one that the traveling nodes emit. So we might think that we're flying towards an entrance of a space twisting node, but end up flying towards this instead. I hate those anglerfish so much. <laughs> They are great. So here's a little anecdote of my own first playthrough of the game. The very first planet that I visited after leaving Timberheart for the very first time was Dark Bramble. The whole place looked a bit dangerous, so I decided to fly really cautiously and flew towards a random light that I saw in the distance. And this light actually carried me towards Feldspar's camp. My very first expedition led me directly to Feldspar by pure chance. Feldspar is the fourth astronaut in space and probably best described by using the scientific term badass. Feldspar is the best pilot of the five astronauts and they are always looking for a new challenge. Currently Feldspar is camping inside the dead anglerfish because they crashed their ship right besides it. And at least judging by their dialogue, they're enjoying their situation quite a bit. The solution on how to reach Felsbus camp is actually hidden behind a pretty long puzzle sequence. You know, we aren't meant to reach this place early and definitely not as the very first location after leaving Timber Harf. Because of this, I ended up being quite confused when I got here the very first time. There is also a corpse of a gigantic jellyfish down here, spiked with a note that those beasts are only good for keeping electricity at bay, but certainly should not be eaten. Cool. And with this we only have one final planet and astronaut left to establish. To reach this one we once again enter our ship and fly through space. But something is strange this time. Suddenly the music changes. Something funny is going on with the sun. We hear a deep, terrifying crumble. And then suddenly the sun explodes. Literally. The sun explodes in a supernova. We can see the shock wave moving forward until it finally reaches us. And then we die. The explosion kills us. And then something curious happens. A sequence plays. A sequence very similar to what happened when we encountered the statue on Timber Harf. We see a recap of what we did before the sun exploded and then we suddenly awake again. At the exact same spot the game started. Looking at the exact same sky seeing a small explosion in the distance, which has traveled back in time to the very beginning of the game and have no idea what happened. This is the core gameplay loop of Outer Wilds and it is the main mystery of the game. Every 22 minutes the sun explodes, our memories replay in front of us and we reawaken at the exact same spot we started the game at. 
The only difference is that this explosion in the sky always looks a bit different, which annoyed me to no end during my first playthrough because, you know, it makes no sense that this looks different every time, but whatever. Other than that, the universe completely resets every 22 minutes. So we once again hop into our spaceship and explore the solar system, which finally brings us to Giant Deep, the place where Gabbro, the last astronaut, is currently at. Giant's Deep is a dangerous planet. The whole planet is a giant ocean with just a bunch of islands swimming on top of it. The sea is terrorized by gigantic, terrifying tornadoes that fling everything that crosses their paths back into space. Everything including entire islands. Below the ocean surface, there is an incredibly strong current that makes it impossible to dive into the depths of the ocean. Below this current is a deadly electrical field, shielding the very core of the planet. We cannot make it past this shield alive but we can spot strange alien plants in the center below it. On one of the islands, we encounter Gabro, relaxing in her hammock. Gabro is the one who found the Noma statue that we encountered earlier in an old Noma workshop close by. Even more curious, Gabro tells us that they had a very similar encounter with one of the statues on this planet earlier. And most curious, Gabro is aware that we are in a time loop. No other Harfian has any idea, but Gabro is aware that we are endlessly dying before being sent back in time. Yet they appear to be quite calm and chill about the whole endlessly dying situation we are stuck in. If we have another chat with him after the time loop reset again, we can ask them how they managed to remain so calm in the face of imminent repeatable death, which unlocks the option to meditate in the main menu. Gabro teaches us about meditation meditation here. If we meditate, we are able to end the current cycle early, which is incredibly useful in the game and something I completely missed during my first playthrough because I never chatted with Gabro again. Funnily enough, however, that is not the only curious thing that Gabro says to us. If we tell them that we believe that we're the only ones who know about the time loop, they answer the following. Yeah, I raided Hornfels again to ask if they had died too, but I'm pretty sure they thought I was being metaphorical. This quote here is really funny, because I believe it's the devs playing an innocent little joke on us, the player here. Here's a spoiler for the ending of this video. The way I understand the story of Outer Wilds, the universe dying is a metaphor for us dying metaphorically. That's a mouthful. Um, I believe what the game ultimately wants to say is that we're free to kill our beliefs in the now and to choose to be reborn as a different version of ourselves at any time. Out of Wilds is about the fact that we can metaphorically die and be reborn into a new self. We have to chat about like a billion things and have to witness the end of the universe several dozen times together before we'll actually reach a point where you can understand why I believe this to be at the center of the game. But let's just assume for a second that against all odds, you end up agreeing with me by the end of this video. If this were the case, well, then this little Gabriel quote would be quite funny, wouldn't it be? Because if Outer Wilds is about our metaphorical death, then Gabriel saying that they radioed Hornfels to talk with them about their death, but Hornfels thought that they were being metaphorical, is a super clever, multi-layered inside joke by the developers. Gabriel wants to know more about their real death, but Hornfels thinks they're talking about their metaphorical death, while the end of the game appears to be about our own death, while as a matter of fact, it is about our metaphorical one. It's a clever twist back on itself. But that's just a side note for now. Hooray! Alright, so with this we now have the five main planets firmly established. There are the Ash Twins that orbit around each other and constantly shift their sand from one to the other. There's Brittle Hollow, which has a dark, heavy black hole in its center that slowly tears the facade of the planet apart. There's Timber Harf, a calm and idyllic planet on the surface, but below it there are volcanic activities that sometimes cause a violent geyser to shoot out of the otherwise peaceful surface. There's Giant's Deep, a planet with a troubled surface and a dark inner core that it's almost impossible to reach, and there is Dark Bramble, a twisted and broken planet that warps in itself and where it is impossible to find a logical path through its mess. So do you notice something when taking a look at all those planets from a distance? Well, it might just be me, but they all work astonishingly well as a metaphor for psychological repression. Repression as defined by Wikipedia, the mechanism that ensures that what is unacceptable to the conscious mind and would, if recalled, arouse anxiety is prevented from entering it. Dark Bramble is an illogical connected place full of terror and it's impossible to make sense of it. Giant's Deep has a terrifying surface and an almost unreachable secret in its center. Brittle Hollow has a dark core, so powerful it tears the surface apart. Timber Harf has an unreachable volcanic core that randomly causes brutal outbursts on the otherwise calm surface. And the Ash Twins, 
Well, those are the ones that fit the least, but they have a weight that permanently shifts between two extreme poles. You know, it's really hard to tell if this was on purpose or if it's just a weird coincidence, but it certainly fits. We'll return to this idea once we finally start to waffle about the ending in approximately 14.3 billion years. But first, something different. In 2011, Jonathan Leavitt and Nicholas Christenfield from the University of San Diego made a really interesting experiment on the psychology of how we enjoy stories. Two different groups of subjects were given three different stories to read. A classic whodunit mystery story, a story with an ironic twist and literary fiction with an uncluttered resolution. The twist? One group got the endings of the story spoiled for them before they read the story. And this is where this becomes interesting. Because contrary to what one might believe, the group that had the ending of the story spoiled actually ended up enjoying them more overall. They repeated the experiment again in 2013 and once again in 2015 and while things are a bit more nuanced, overall they always discovered that spoilers don't seem to ruin the enjoyment of a story for people. If anything, they do enhance it. You know, we usually have this idea that a story or an experience like a game can be spoiled by knowing what happens in it. Spoiled in the sense that it is rotten and ruined afterwards and no longer worth consuming and um, I'd like to challenge this idea a bit. Most of the science that I ever saw on the topic seem to suggest that this is simply not the case. Apparently you can't spoil the enjoyment out of a movie or a game by knowing what happens in it. And you know, it kind of makes sense. A good plot reveal isn't good because it is surprising. It is good because it is logical and moves the story forward in interesting directions. You know, randomly shooting someone in a movie for no reason would be surprising, but it would certainly not be good storytelling. But knowing that the Titanic is going to hit that iceberg at some point in a movie doesn't change the fact that it is enjoyable to follow all the characters on their journey from set out to sink proud. With games it's even more obvious why this might be the case. Having seen a really cool boss before encountering it can never destroy the experience of actually fighting the thing ourselves. We might know about the thing but we can't experience what it is to fight the thing just because someone showed us the thing before. That's something that inherently can't be taken away from us, you know? It can't be spoiled. And it might sound strange but if we approach spoilers with the idea that no one is able to spoil an experience for us, well then it makes navigating the internet a hell of a lot easier, doesn't it? Just to be clear here, I'll always make sure to put up appropriate spoiler warnings because whether you care about running into spoilers every once in a while or do not is definitely not for me to decide. But you know, I stopped stressing myself because of spoilers a long time ago and I didn't notice that I ended up enjoying anything any less. Okay, so far so good. So why the wiggler do I bring this up in a video about Outer Wilds? Well, um, because Outer Wilds is different. Outer Wilds can actually be spoiled to the point where the game can no longer be experienced as it is intended to. And people that approach spoilers with a I don't care, media's inherently unspoilable attitude, like I do, need an actual and proper spoiler warning before they continue watching. So speaking to all of you, chill people who usually live their lives without the existential fear of being spoiled. Outer Wilds is a game about discovering the story of the game ourselves. I actually made sure that the video doesn't give anything too important away up until here. But from here on out, we'll discuss the entire story in detail. A story that you will know afterwards. This is not like knowing the final twist of Fight Club or having seen Souls bosses before actually encountering them ourselves. Outer Wilds can really be ruined. You can no longer have the experience of uncovering the story for yourself after you learned about it once. And discovering Outer Wilds story is, at least in my humble opinion, well worth experiencing. So be warned. Hooray! And with this we finally have established all the fluff necessary to finally dig ourselves into the story and the mysteries of Outer Wilds. So let's start in a Mushroom Kingdom. Spoiler warning for core plot points of Super Mario Odyssey ahead. Just remember that you've made it this far and it's just a bit farther now. Super Mario Odyssey begins with Mario fighting atop an airship against his old arch-turtle enemy, Bowser, who tries to kidnap Princess Peach. And would you believe it? Mario loses the fight, which sets the plot in motion. From there on out, we chase Bowser from kingdom to kingdom, while Bowser is making preparations for his planned wedding with Peach. Only at the very end of the game do we manage to finally reach the princess and to save her. The end. That's basically the plot of Super Mario Odyssey. So why are we waffling about the story of Super Mario Odyssey in a video about Outer Wilds? One might ask. Well, because of its plot structure. The game starts with Bowser kidnapping Peach and ends with us saving her. In Odyssey, the story takes place as we play it. 
most video game plots work like this, you know? There is some sort of conflict that marks the beginning of the story, and the game is about us struggling to solve this conflict until it is resolved at the very end. The plot takes place while we play the game. Outer Wilds is nothing like this. In Outer Wilds, most of the plot already took place, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and our own small contribution to the story is at the very end of it. Outer Wilds narrative literally spans over thousands of years, but our contributions all just take place during the last 22 minutes of the narrative. Our main task is to puzzle together the story that happened before, which is a really interesting and unique approach to storytelling. But what is this story that took place before the game began? The Nomai are a nomadic race that travels from sun system to sun system in search of knowledge and scientific progress. Each clan of the Nomai travels on a huge ship called a vessel. Originally, the Nomai weren't native to our solar system. But this changed one day. It all began with a signal. One day, the Nomai clan led by Askel received a strange signal. A signal that was older than the universe itself. The Nomai called whatever was emitting the signal the Eye of the Universe, and they decided to at once warp their vessel towards the signal. But the warp did not work as intended. Instead of arriving at the Eye of the Universe, the vessel crashed into the vines of Dark Bramble, everyone's favorite anglerfish planet. The Nomai aboard the vessel tried to escape via three different escape pods. One landed on Brittle Hollow, one landed on Amber Twin, and the third and final escape pod landed in Dark Bramble. The third escape pod is the one that Eskal was part of. The Nomai tried to find a way back to their crashed mothership, but they weren't familiar with Dark Bramble's space warping properties. They all died when they ran out of air. Their bodies still float peacefully in Dark Bramble up until the current day. The other two vessels, however, fared better. The survivors that landed on Brittle Hollow made their way past the surface of the dangerous planet, built a small settlement there at first and later a bigger settlement, the Hanging City. The survivors that landed on the Amber Twin fled into its cave system, where they found shelter and built a sunless city. This was probably the darkest hour for the stranded Nomai. Their leader and many of their friends were dead. The survivors themselves were separated over two different planets, with no way to reunite. But slowly, the tides were turning again. The Nomai regained bits and pieces of their former technological knowledge. At first, they managed to build gravity cannons on the Amber Twin and on Brittle Hollow, cannons that allowed them to reconnect with the other survivors. They built shrines dedicated to the Eye of the Universe, where they worshipped the signal that led them to the solar system like a divine entity. As they reconnected and regained their lost knowledge, they tried to solve the mystery that led them to the solar system in the very first place. They set out to locate the Eye of the Universe. But as it turns out, this task is easier said than done. The signal that led them here had disappeared. They built locators, small at first, bigger later on, trying to find the signal again. But the signal was nowhere to be heard. They weren't able to locate the eye by searching for the signal. Luckily, this wasn't their only shot. They noticed a strange moon inhabiting their solar system. A moon that appeared to visit different planets at seemingly random times. A moon they hypothesized to be the moon of the eye of the universe. The quantum moon. Shards of this moon landed on planets all over the sun system. The Nomai began to study those shards, trying to uncover their true nature. And they were successful. They found a way to actually visit this quantum moon. But not only did they find a way to land there, as it turns out, their assumption was correct as well. The quantum moon is the moon of the eye of the universe, and it actually visits the eye. This allowed the Nomai to see the eye of the universe for the very first time with their own free eyes. Sadly though, they still weren't able to reach it because of the moon's strange quantum properties. So traveling to the quantum moon became a spiritual coming of age ritual for the Nomai. But shortly after, they made an incredible scientific discovery. The Nomai were trying to come up with warp core teleporters that allowed them to warp between the planets easily by sending things through a black hole to a corresponding white hole. As it turns out, items that are warped arrive milliseconds earlier at the destination than they were sent. Warping sends things back in time on a micro scale. And it was this discovery that gave the Nomai a new idea on how they could potentially find the eye of the universe, the Ash Twin Project.
The laboratory where the Nomai conducted the research with the black and white holes is still intact and we can find it on the Ember Twin. In this lab we can repeat the exact same experiments that the Nomai must have used. We can use a black hole core and a white hole core to create two linked holes. So if we now shoot our cute little probe scout into the black hole then we can actually see the probe cannon leave the white hole before it actually enters the black hole. That's a cute little thing that they put into the game to visualize the effect and I really like like this small section, but that is not the reason why we're talking about it. The reason is something different. See, time traveling in stories is always a bit weird because it is so incredibly easy to poke holes into time traveling narratives by creating paradoxes within them. And this research lab is a perfect place to demonstrate the problem with telling tales about traveling through time. See, the probe leaves the warp core before it even enters it. But what would happen if we were to take out the core after the probe already already left the white hole but before it entered the black hole. In this case the probe that leaves the hole never entered it. We would have duplicated the drone by abusing a time traveling paradox. Here is what happens in the game if we try this. They actually thought about it and hid a secret ending behind it. But it is not only this little thing that they thought of. Later in the game we actually find out what is causing the time loop. It is another black hole. If we jump into this black hole directly before the time loop resets, then we travel 22 minutes back in time and only then the time loop is reset by 22 minutes. Which means we duplicated ourselves. And would you believe it? We can actually meet ourselves at the spot where we jumped into the hole cycle earlier. We can have a conversation with ourselves. If we now happen to die or to end the cycle without jumping into the black hole again, well then we once again created a time traveling paradox and once again destroyed the fabric of space time. They thought about this as well. And it's not just the endings. Everything in the game makes this level of sense. Take the islands on the surface of Giant's Deep. Giant's Deep is a water planet. So where do those islands come from? Well, are pieces that were sling into space when the original Dark Bramble collapsed. Dark Bramble used to be an ice planet. The jellyfish that we find in the depths of Giant's Deep actually weren't native to Giant's Deep. They used to live below the ice crust in Dark Bramble before the planet collapsed and this event is what transported them to Giant's Deep. The whole game is like this. Nothing in the game is placed arbitrarily. Take the extinction of the Nomai. Later we learn that a comet, the interloper, entered the sun system at some point in the past. This comet was filled to the brim with ghost matter and the comet was under insane pressure. It exploded and the entire universe was filled with this ghost matter in an instant. So we do not exactly know what ghost matter is, it is a mysterious substance from outer space. All that we do know is that it emits extremely lethal radiation. The explosion of the interloper filled the entire universe with this ghost matter. It killed almost all life in the entire solar system in an instant. It is what caused the extinction of the Nomai. There still remains of this ghost matter around that is slowly decaying. It did however not kill the jellyfish or the back then aquatic ancestors of the Harthians. And there is a very good reason why those were able to survive. Ghost matter isn't dangerous underwater. We can experience this for ourselves. When an island drops back to the surface of Giant's Deep, it is underwater for a second. During this time, we can safely dive through ghost matter filled caves. You know, they even have an answer to the question why the Nomai went extinct because of the ghost matter, but our ancestors, the ancestors of the Harthians, did not. There is even a small explanation why our ship computer is able to store information through time. It contains a part of one of the memory statues. You know, the world in Outer Wilds is incredibly satisfying to explore because we can trust the developers that they did not put anything there for arbitrary reasons. Everything that we encounter has a reason to be there and it is this fact that makes it worthwhile to think about the world in the first place. And then there is the fact that there is a tiny hidden emergency checked button in our ship that makes the cockpit go we have just lost cabin pressure. That's in no way relevant for a discussion of Outer Wilds world or history, but there is no way I do not mention it in this video. We were talking about the Ash Twin project. When the Nomai made the discovery that warp cores were able to send items back in time, they had pretty much exhausted all their options to ever find the eye of the universe. They weren't able to pick up the signal again and even though they knew that the eye existed because of the quantum moon, they weren't able to reach it from there. They had exhausted all their options to ever find the eye of the universe. 
every option but stumbling into it by pure luck. Their only chance left to find it would have been to fly into a random direction and to discover the eye of the universe there by pure chance. But the chance for something like this to happen is abysmally small. If we only try it once. But if they were to send a drone into a random direction millions and millions of times, then sooner or later one of those drones must find the eye by pure chance. And this idea gave birth to the Ash Twin project. They planned to send a drone searching for the eye into a random direction for 22 minutes, hoping it would find the eye. If it wouldn't, they simply wanted to reset the entire space-time and to send it into a new direction, repeating this cycle until the probe finally found the eye. They already had the technology to send things back in time, the warp technology. All that they needed was tech that allowed them to send their own memories through time, so that they were aware that the loop was happening, and a way to harness enough energy to send the entire solar system back in time. The technology to send their memories back in time was quickly found. It's the statues, the very statues that we and Gabro interacted with. Those are the reason we are aware of what is happening to us. We activated one of the statues the moment the time loop started. They built those in a workshop in Giant's Deep. Getting enough energy, however, well, that was a problem. The only thing that could provide enough energy to send the entire solar system back in time was a supernova, the explosion of the sun. And this is exactly what the Nomai planned on doing. They came up with a plan to cause the sun to explode, to harness the energy of the explosion and to send the universe back in time afterwards. One part of the Nomai began constructing the project in the heart of the Ash Twin. They built an extremely strong shell with ores from Timber Hearth, a shell that should be able to withstand the supernova for long enough to harness its energy, and they hid the masks there that were linked with the statues and stored their memories. At the center of the project is a single warp core that powered the whole thing, a warp core similar to the one of the vessel that warped the Nomai into the sun system to begin with. On Shine's Deep, they built the orbital probe cannon, the cannon that shoots a probe into a new direction every loop and records where one found the eye. The explosion that we see every time we reawaken is actually the probe cannon firing into a new random direction. And then there is the Sun Station, a small satellite station that orbits the Sun. There they try to build a contraption that causes the Sun to explode and for it to go supernova. And after a while, they were all finished. The Ash Twin project was functioning and complete, the orbital probe cannon up in space and running, and the Sun Station, well the Sun Station was ready to fire and to cause the Sun to explode. They were ready to start, the Sun Station fired, and... Nothing happened. The Nomai had failed. The Sun Station was useless. It wasn't able to cause the Sun to explode. The Nomai were devastated. Shortly afterwards, they decided to investigate a strange asteroid that had entered the Sun system for the first time. The Interloper. The Interloper that brought the ghost matter into the universe. Days later, all the Nomai were dead. This is roughly the story that happened before we entered the stage. Hundreds of thousands of years later, the Sun has reached the end of its natural life. During our timeline, the Sun naturally collapses into a supernova. This causes the loop to activate, the cannon to fire and the probe to search for the coordinates of the eye. This is the reason why we are in a time loop. We now have to end what the Nomai began many thousand years before us. But before we discuss how we actually can locate and reach the eye of the universe ourselves, we first have to have a quick chat about something different. We first have to talk about a bunch of real science that inspired the mechanics of Outer Wilds because otherwise we can't make any sense of the ending. So let's talk science for a second. Let's talk about light. We are now ready to begin the test proper. Here's a fun question to think about. What is light? You know, we all know what light is, but what is light physically? Are there tiny light particles flying around illuminating what they hit? Or is light a wave that travels from a light source the same way sound does? Is it an electromagnetic field? You know, what is the nature of the thing? If you're struggling to answer this question, don't worry, you're not alone. Actually, the nature of light was one of the most debated topics in physics for hundreds of years. Newton believed that light must be a particle as early as 1675, but only five years later, in 
writer Kristen Hughes released his treatise on light, making a good argument that light is a wave. The problem, there were pretty good arguments to be made for both ideas, but you know, light obviously can't be a particle and a wave at the same time, since both behave vastly differently. It was only a hundred years later that a quite literally young physicist, namely Thomas Young, was able to solve this dispute. So what did he do? Well, he shot monochromatic light at two slits and measured how the result on the other side looked like. Here's the thing with slits. If a wave goes through two slits, it afterwards interferes with itself. You know, waves add and subtract from each other. We can see this when we throw two rocks into a still pool of water. Particles, on the other hand, don't care about slits. They are like, wee and just go through them. No questions asked. So if light were a particle, the result on the other side would look something like this. If it were a wave, it must look something like that, however. I'm simplifying everything a bit to make it easier to understand. I'll leave a link by an actual physicist explaining the concept in the description if you're curious and want to get an explanation by someone who is actually qualified to waffle about this. Cool. So Thomas Young shot light through the slit and the result was an interference pattern. Light is a wave. Case closed. Discussion ended. Humanity gained 500 experience points and Thomas Young won. The only problem? In the early 20th century, a lot of physical evidence suddenly pops up that suggests light might be a particle after all. What is going on here? Well, to find the answer, we have to return to our double slits once again. Because those innocently looking slits carry a terrifying secret. To unravel this mystery, we have to shoot atoms through the slits. But let's do this a bit differently this time. Let's close one of the two slits at first, and let's just shoot atoms through a single one. So we shoot atoms randomly at the slit and see what pattern forms behind. It's a pattern like this one. No surprises here. The atoms just fly through and form a pattern on the other side. The thing gets weird once we open the second slit, because now the atoms suddenly create an interference pattern again the pattern a wave creates. The same pattern is the result if we send the atoms into the slit one by one, meaning each atom somehow contributes to an overall wave-like behavior, even though it is a localized particle. Somehow the particles seem to be aware that there are now two slits because their behavior changed. But things get even weirder if we change the experiment even further. We do a very simple thing. A simple thing that using conventional logic should never ever in a thousand years alter the resulting pattern. We observe through which slit the atom goes. We simply put a detector at the slits that tells us through which slit the particle went. Okay, so we fire the atoms through, we observe through which slit they pass through, and in the end, they create this pattern. Suddenly the atoms behave like particles again. Yep, but it gets even weirder. This time, we leave the detector in place, but sneakily disable it. We just pull out the plug, but we don't tell the particles that the detector isn't powered anymore, you know? It's still there, but it doesn't observe what the particles do. And suddenly they create an interference pattern again. They once again behave like waves. This here is one of the central mysteries that quantum physics started to resolve around. How can a particle know that we're observing what it does by taking a measurement and then change its behavior accordingly. We can't explain this using traditional physical concepts and common sense. It's also the answer to what light is. Light is both or neither. It behaves like a particle in some circumstances and like a wave in others. The atom is a wave with a probability of being at any possible position. Only once we take a measurement and observe the atom, this probability collapses and the atom suddenly has a fixed position in space. Again, that's just a very basic description of core ideas in quantum physics and given the complexity of the topic, I very likely muddled some details. So if you want to learn more about the topic, listen to people that are qualified to waffle about it. But why are we waffling about this in a video about outer wilds, one might ask. Well, for three reasons. First, because it's insanely cool, isn't it? Second, we need to roughly understand this to make sense of the subtext of Outer Wilds ending. And third, well, third, because one of the most central mysteries of the game is inspired by exactly those mysteries. The mystery of the quantum moon. The moon is in superposition. It exists as a probability at several positions at once. It is at Timber Harf, at the Hourglass Twins, at Shine Steep, at Dark Bramble, at Brittle Hollow, and at the Eye of the Universe all at once. 
just as a probability. Only when we look at one of those planets, which is like taking a measurement, the probability of the moon being at one of those places collapses, which may reveal the moon. When we look away and back at the same position again, we take a new measurement and the moon may manifest at this position or more likely at another one. Whenever we try to fly into the moon, a huge atmospheric cloud clouds our view and we are unable to land on top of it. In the logic of the game, the cloud prevents us from seeing seeing the moon, meaning it once again turns into a probability everywhere at once and disappears for us. If we actually want to land on top of the moon, we first have to learn more about quantum objects in a Nomai tower hidden at one of the poles of Giant's Deep. There we learn that our camera is also able to observe objects. If we fly into the clouds of the quantum moon, while we look at a picture of the moon, well, then we're still observing it, which allows us to land. That's an artistic liberty and has nothing to do with how the thing works in reality, but I don't care because it is cool. On the surface of the moon, we find a tower. If we close the door and turn off the lights, then, well, then suddenly nothing is observing the moon anymore, meaning the tower is in superposition. That's again not how anything works in the real world, but it is admittedly a lot cooler. Using this trick, we were able to teleport from position to position by turning our light on and off until the position of the moon finally collapses at the eye of the universe. If we do this at the north pole of the moon, we are able to explore the moon while it is orbiting the eye. But this isn't the big surprise here. The big surprise is that there is actually a Nomai here, a living Nomai woman called Solanum. Encountering Solanum here below the eye of the universe for the very first time is an incredibly strong moment. It is such a huge surprise. It's great. She summons a bunch of stones that we can combine to ask her questions. Her answers tell us a lot of critical information to understand the game's narrative. So first, the eye is what gave the moon its quantum properties. The eye is maximally unobserved uncertainty and the moon got its quantum properties by being so close to the eye. Second, she tells us that she suspects she isn't entirely alive more on that in a second. Third, if we ask her about ourselves and the eye of the universe, she says something really interesting. She says, suppose you could reach the eye of the universe, would you try to enter it? What do you imagine the effects of a conscious observer might be? You know, she asks the hypothetical question of what would happen if we, as a conscious observer, were to observe maximum uncertainty. She implies that observing the eye of the universe would collapse all possible states of the universe into a new one, which is exactly what we're doing during the ending. More on that in a second. We can try to fly into the moon's reflection of the eye here. If we do so, we suddenly awaken on top of the quantum moon again, a dead Nomai right in front of us. This dead Nomai is Solanum. The game spawns us right in front of Solanum's corpse, right after we chatted with her. So what the heck is going on? Well, here's the thing. Solanum was on her pilgrimage to the quantum moon when the ghost matter killed everything in the universe. In the logic of the game, this means that she was at six positions at once when Interloper burst. She was at every planet and at the eye of the universe all at once. The explosion instantly killed everything in the solar system. But only five of her positions were in the solar system. Her sixth possible position was at the eye. Because of this, five probable versions of her died, while the sixth possible version of her remained unharmed. This trapped her in a weird state between life and death, where she's dead on the normal five positions of the moon and alive on the sixth one. She's quite literally Schrödinger's cat. And I love that they added this little explanation on why we can meet her. There is even a secret ending hidden behind this idea. If we deactivate the time loop and then travel to the quantum moon, we can share Solanum's fate. The supernova then kills us on five positions and leaves us alive in the sixth one, which causes the game to show us this ending. Hooray! So at this point we have investigated and uncovered most of the mysteries of the past and we have visited the quantum moon and mastered the quantum mechanics of the game. All that is now left to do for us is to put all the pieces together. It's time to solve the final mysteries of the game and to finally end the time loop. Whatever's out there, I want you to know I'm ready for it. The very first thing we see in Outer Wilds after starting a new game is the orbital probe cannon firing a drone into a random direction. 
But while this may be the first time we consciously witness the cannon shooting, it isn't the first time the cannon shoots. As a matter of fact, it shot the probe about 9 million times before. The probe we see flying through space also isn't an ordinary probe like the millions before. Because this probe is the one to actually reach the eye of the universe. But we aren't awakening for the very first time either. We as well have awoken here millions of times before. We just weren't aware of it because we weren't linked to a statue. But now that the probe finally found the eye of the universe, the statues finally activate, which is what happens when we leave the museum. As it turns out, the Nomai's technology worked. The Ashwin project was able to use the energy of the exploding sun to create a time loop, using an advanced warp core and producing a black hole that sent the sun system 22 minutes back in time. The orbital probe cannon fired a new probe at the beginning of each time loop and the statues activated once the eye was reached. Everything worked as the Nomai had planned. The only problem, they weren't able to cause a supernova. This, however, did not delay their plan indefinitely, because hundreds of thousands of years later, the sun naturally died, causing a supernova, activating all the machinery and starting the time loop. Here's where we come into play. If we were to learn the exact coordinates of the eye of the universe, and if we were to enter the Ashtrin project and to remove the warp core that is causing the time loops, and if we were then to take this warp core to the crashed vessel with which the Nomai originally arrived in the solar system, the one hidden in the depths of Dark Bramble, well, then we could enter the coordinates of the eye of the universe into the vessel, we could restore the power of the ship by swapping out the broken warp core, and we could use the same technology that brought the Nomai to this universe to actually warp towards the eye of the universe ourselves. That's the ultimate goal of the game. But for this to happen, we first have to overcome a bunch of problems. The first one is how to actually learn the coordinates of the eye of the universe. See, the poor launch cannon broke apart the second the cannon fired, and one of its modules fell onto Giant's Deep, where it sank towards Giant's Deep's core. This module is, of course, the one where the coordinates are recorded in. How are we supposed to reach it? And that's just our first problem. We also have no idea how to reach the center of the Ash Twin project, as it is at the core of the Ash Twins, enclosed in a shell strong enough to even withstand a supernova for a couple of seconds. Finally, while we are able to locate the position of the vessel using our probe cannon, we can't reach it. The only way to reach the vessel is through this node. This node is blocked by three terrifying angular fish that devour everything that tries to fly past them. How are we supposed to get past them? Those three mysteries are the final mysteries in Outer Wilds, and solving them is one of the most rewarding experiences I've ever experienced in any game ever. The mysteries are so well set up and the resolution is so worth it. It's incredible. So first, reaching the core of Giant's Deep. Earlier, we found a research lab where the Nomai studied the nature of Giant's Deep Cyclones. And would you believe it, not all tornadoes sling us back into space. There is another very rare type of cyclone that does the opposite. This one pushes us below the strong current. This type of cyclone rotates counterclockwise. So we investigate Giant's Deep surface, looking for a cyclone rotating into the other direction, actually find one, we enter it, and... We get pushed into the depths of Giant's Deep, but we aren't able to reach the center yet. There is still the lethal electrical field protecting the very core of the planet. We aren't able to make it past this field ourselves. However, the jellyfish are. If we carefully swim below a jellyfish, as it slowly sinks down towards the magnetic field, the jellyfish actually pushes us below the surface without us being electrocuted. The jellyfish protect us and allow us to reach the very depths of the planet. We are now at the center of Giant's Deep. There is no music playing. We approach the sunken module in silence. We enter it, and inside we find the coordinates of the eye of the universe. Those three simple symbols are the coordinates. This is what all the trouble was about. Now we only need to figure out how to enter the Ash Twin project. Earlier we fell through the black hole in the center of Brittle Hollow, which warped us to the white hole. There we found the white hole station, a small emergency building that taught us how to warp between planets. You see, if we stand on one of the Nomai created warp pads and look into the sky, then we warp to the corresponding warp pad as soon as the planet is visible to us. 
This is the technology that the Noma used to enter the core of the Ash Twin. All that we have to do is to stand on the Ash Twin's warp pad and look upwards the second the twin planets are aligned. This, however, only happens when the terrifying pillar of sand is right on top of us. So we enter the sandstorm, looking up, which actually teleports us into the center of the Ash Twin. This here is the source of the time loop. This little warp core here is causing all the trouble. If we remove this core, the loop is over. The next time the sun explodes will be the final time. We only have a couple of minutes to transport the core to the vessel and to teleport to the coordinates of the eye of the universe before the sun collapses for good. The training wheels are off. There is no time loop saving us this time. This is the last time the sun is going to explode. So gentle ladies, gentlemen and gentle people in general, once we remove this core and start to race to the vessel in Deep Bramble, we start one of the most memorable sequences in any game ever. Taking the core through Dark Bramble is such a terrifying and memorable experience. It is hard to put into words how incredible it is. I've beaten the game several times, yet to this day, I still get goosebumps every time I approach the final loop's most tense section, the sleeping anglerfish. So the anglerfish, the thing is the following. Those fish are blind. We learned that earlier by reading some child scribblings on the Amber Twin. The angular fish can't see ship. They track us using sound. So theoretically, it is possible to make it past them by perfectly positioning our ship beforehand and then to just slightly accelerate so that we silently drift past them without making any noise. If we drift slightly into the wrong direction, however, then we end up crashing into one of the fish, causing not only our death, but the death of the entire solar system. So we accelerate, we let go of the controls, we float towards the anglerfish, and then we hold our warp core tight and pray to all the fuzzy gods that we do not crash into one of them. This moment here, the 15 seconds we float past the anglerfish, where we know that we can't do anything anymore and just hope that we survive, is one of gaming's greatest moments. At least in my humble opinion, this moment is so strong that barely anything I ever played even came close to this level of tension. It's so well crafted, it's incredible. Once we left the fish behind us, there is nothing stopping us from reaching the vessel anymore. We reached the vessel, the very place where the entire plot began hundreds of thousands of years earlier. Inside it, we find messages from other Nomai clans. Recent messages. The Nomai are reaching out to anyone who can hear them. Apparently, the universe is dying. We find the broken warp core at the center of the ship and we replace it with the one from the Ash Twin project. And suddenly, the power returns. All that is left to do for us now is to enter the coordinates of the eye of the universe and to activate the warp function. We arrive at an unknown place in space. There is nothing here but this turbulence in front of us. I was a bit late to the party during my latest playthrough. Because of this, I got to see something else as well. I got to see the supernova happen from afar. This explosion there is the sun exploding in our solar system. It's the destruction of every place we visited so far. There is nowhere to go back now. All that we can do is visit the eye of the universe. We activate the warping function of the vessel, which brings us to the surface. The surface looks very unsettling. It is dark. There are lightning strikes everywhere. All the objects around us appear to be of quantum nature. In the distance, we can hear the echo of screams. Whatever is crying out, it sounds as if it is in pain. We hear thunder explode in the distance. The screaming intensifies. Suddenly trees appear and fade away. The lightning strikes come faster and faster. The thunder gets louder and louder. And then we see something above us. Something that tears a hole into the sky. A vortex that appears to lead to nothing but black darkness. We can circle around a structure, which allows us to stand right in front of this vortex. We are now standing in front of a black void of nothingness. Our only way forward is to take the plunge. But before we jump, we first have to chat about something else. See, symbolically, the eye of the universe is God. 
It is older than the universe. The Nomai build shrines worshipping it. It is what created this universe, and it is certainly no force that can be explained by common logic. The eye of the universe is a metaphor for something divine, beyond human understanding. And it is calling for us. It sent out the signal in the hopes to find someone to witness it dying. The entire universe is about to die, and only if we are here to witness the death of everything, only then something new can be born. The eye of the universe, the force that created the current universe as standing for God, is calling out to us to witness the death of all that is. Metaphorically, we're walking towards a funeral here. We're about to witness the death and rebirth of God. So let's talk about the death of God. Everything that lives is designed to end. The Capuchin Crypt in Vienna is the main burial place of the House of Habsburg. Beginning in the early 17th century, dozens and dozens of Habsburgers found their final resting place in a crypt beneath the Capuchin Monastery, among them many emperors. There is one very curious thing inside of it. You see, when visiting the place, we just walk along all the coffins beginning in the early 17th century and walk from one past generation of Habsburgers to the next. Because of this, we get to see how the coffins changed over the generations. The early emperors rest in quite simple coffins, but as time passed and as the influence of the House of Habsburg grew and grew, the coffins became more and more extraordinary, until they are almost comically large and pompous. This is the coffin in which Empress Maria Theresia and Emperor Franz I rest. And this here, directly in front of this huge gravesite, is the coffin of the Austrian Emperor that followed them. This is the grave of Emperor Joseph II, Maria Theresia's son. Quite a difference, isn't it? It's just a simple copper coffin. As a matter of fact, most Habsburger chose to be buried in simple copper coffins afterwards. Which leaves us with a question. Why? Why did the Habsburgers suddenly decide to be buried in simplistic coffins bare of any decoration, even though the house lost none of its power and influence? Some massive social shift must have taken place that led to the emperors suddenly resenting the pomp of the past. And this societal shift is the Enlightenment. Beginning in the early 17th century, the Enlightenment slowly brought the idea that the universe was governed by physical laws and not by divine providence into the mainstream. Philosophy brought forward the idea that governments don't need to be organized around an idea of divine right, but can also be founded on the rationality of the governed. And thinkers came forward with new moral theories that existed without any reference to God. Reason, logic and science slowly displaced the divine and the church as the driving force in society. A societal change on this level obviously took a while, but it left gigantic marks everywhere, up to how emperors chose to be buried. Joseph II was an enlightened emperor. He simply thought pompous coffins were a terrible waste of money. Money that could be used for something useful instead. And thus he rests in his copper coffin up until today. The Age of Enlightenment caused a lot of things that we nowadays take for granted. The first constitutions pop up, the first idea of essential human rights pop up, science is established as a source of knowledge, and the Catholic Church's influence on society drastically decreases. Generation by generation those ideas kept spreading. And by the second half of the 19th century, they were widely believed and accepted everywhere. And it is during this time that a young critical thinker writes down one of the most well-known sentences in all of philosophy. God is dead. The author, of course, is Friedrich Nietzsche. When Nietzsche wrote God is dead, he wasn't making a statement about religion or theology. Nietzsche is making an observation about the post-enlightenment world he is living in. Europe no longer needed God as the source for all morality values to explain natural phenomenons or to bring order into the universe. Science and philosophy were more than capable of doing that for us instead. Nietzsche thought that we had killed God in our search for science and reason. But Nietzsche did not think that this development was a good thing. On the contrary, it worried him. See, when science became our main way to explain the world around us, it also opened a rift which science isn't able to fill. So 
Most people nowadays will probably agree, if a lightning strike hits our home, it is because of a natural phenomenon caused by electrical discharges and not God punishing us for not honoring our mother enough or whatever. Turns out science is really really good at explaining the world around us, much better than the Catholic Church of the 17th century was at least. But there's also a problem, because science is really bad at explaining abstract ideas like the meaning of your life, who you truly are, what values you should live by and what the ultimate purpose of your life is. You know, it's kinda hard to put those things into graphs and we can't even put them under a microscope. Before the age of enlightenment, however, those questions had simple, universally true answers. At least in Europe, the church gave the answers to all those questions. You should value what God tells you, you are here to live your life according to God's rules and if you manage to do that, God will reward you in the afterlife. It's as simple as that. So here's a problem that most religions face. They are absolute belief systems. They not only strive to explain what happens after we die and why we are here in the first place, they also want to explain why lightning strikes, where it strikes, what the nature of the sun and the moon is, what we should value in life and even what and what not to eat. They are absolute in their approach to explain the world. And absolute belief systems are great because they give us answers to every single potential question that could ever ruffle our poor human feathers. Why did a bad thing happen to the Johnsons? Why is it raining today? Why do I suffer? Where does the facial rash come from? And why are the people that are in charge actually the people that are in charge? The answer is always because of a divine plan. We're all part of something greater and that ultimately gives our lives meaning. Just to be clear here, that is no commentary on modern faith. More on this in a second. This is just the reality that most of Europe lived in before the Age of Enlightenment happened. People didn't have to question much about anything because religion gave them an absolute answer to everything. Which brings us to the problem with absolute systems. They have a weakness. They collapse as soon as they fail to explain a single thing. Because if there is just one thing that an absolute system can't explain, it isn't much of an absolute system anymore, is it? The whole sex appeal of such systems is that they can explain everything. If there is one thing they can't explain, the entire system collapses. And this is exactly what scientific progress did to the church past the age of enlightenment. It just became plainly obvious that scientists are a lot better at building cool things, predicting the weather or manipulating the environment around us than the church was. This made the absolute belief system collapse that people in Europe have lived under for hundreds and hundreds of years. Just to be super duper clear here, neither Nietzsche nor I are saying that it isn't possible to still live a life in faith of a Christian God or anything. There are people everywhere doing exactly this. What Nietzsche is saying is that there is friction to living a life like this today. But for most of Western history, there was massive friction when trying to live a life in any way, not exactly following the teachings of the church. It's equally valid to be an atheist today as it is to be religious, which means we have to decide on something. The society we are born in doesn't automatically answer those questions for us anymore. Religion isn't able to make the decision for us in absolute terms anymore, because science and reason just prove to be too useful. You know, even the Vatican has high-speed fiber optic network nowadays. But as good as science is at explaining our surroundings, science makes for a terrible theological teacher. Science really sucks at explaining why we are here, what we should value, what happens to us once we die and what the ultimate purpose of our lives actually is. But with the church collapsing as an absolute system and science not being able to answer those questions, well with this there are suddenly no answers to those questions anymore. This is, at least as I understand it, what Nietzsche fundamentally meant when he wrote that God is dead. Nietzsche understood that humans crave for meaning and purpose in their lives and he was worried what would fill the hole that God left behind. He was worried that something terrible might fill the void. And you know, he certainly wasn't wrong because the years after his death gave birth to the nationalist, fascist and communist movements that defined the 20th century. So we are all left with a bunch of questions. Who am I? Why am I? What is the purpose of my life? What happens to me once I die? Why do I suffer? And so on. If religion isn't able to absolutely answer those questions for us, who is? And from this fundamental problem, a new school of philosophy sprouts. Existentialism, the philosophy of the meaning and value of human existence. Thinkers like Sartre, de Beauvoir, Camus, Heidegger, Kierkegaard and many others start to bang their heads against this fundamental problem. And they all come up with a bunch of similar ideas. And Otto Wiles is 
at least in my understanding, deeply inspired by a lot of those ideas. Why I do believe that hopefully becomes obvious once we finally take the plunge into the nothingness we're currently standing in front of. But sadly, we aren't ready to jump quite yet, because we first have to take a look at some of those existentialist ideas. Before we dive in, just a disclaimer, I'm mixing and matching a lot of different ideas that different existentialist thinkers had at different times. All of this is super complex, and I'm not even trying to discuss all of this with razor-sharp scientific precision, because our game at hand doesn't do either. It's just a rough overview over a bunch of existentialist ideas that I believe smuggled themselves into Outer Wilds subtext. If you're interested into those ideas, I left a bunch of links in the description. Awesome. So let's warp into existentialism. Let's do a quick thought experiment. Let's think of our own future as an infinite number of possible versions of our own self that all exist as probabilities somewhere. Whenever we take an action, all those possibilities collapse like quantums do and suddenly our new self springs into existence. The future of this self once again exists in infinitely many possible versions until we take an action and so on. Here's the thing, if we are unaware of all the possible versions that we could be in the future, if we just live our lives as they are, winging the days as they come and never consciously reflect what we do and why we do it and who we actually want to be, then it will be randomly decided which future we end up living. You know, maybe we had a really terrible biology teacher and because of this we end up as a certain version of ourselves. Or we had a terrible breakup and that changed the entire direction of our lives. Or we chose to study a certain discipline because it was our parents wish to do so and that is why we ended up an anthropologist. Life just happens and randomly sends us into a direction, it's unavoidable. If we just let our lives play out as they happen without ever interfering at any point, then whatever we end up being is decided by chance. This is in part what Sartre meant when he wrote his most famous poster quote, existence precedes essence, which is fancy philosopher slang for saying that we exist in the world before we actually are anything. At first we are and only then our lives are given any meaning. Maybe our childhood defines us, maybe our biology teacher, maybe our job, maybe an accident and so on. You get the gist. We first are and then we become what we are, not the other way around. Here is where this gets interesting. If we embrace Nietzsche's idea that God is dead, you know, if we embrace the idea that there is nothing outside of us that gives our lives any purpose or meaning, if we accept that there is no absolute system that will ever explain our existence to us in its entirety, well then what is stopping us from changing the directions our lives are heading, ourselves? What is stopping us from consciously deciding which one out of all the possible selves we could be, we want to be? What stops us from defining our own essence? What stops us from giving our own lives meaning? If we're truly free, why aren't we all embracing this freedom? And then there's our own mortality, the fact that we'll die one day. You see, if we're truly free, but we'll die one day, then it is impossible for us to live all our potential versions of ourselves. Our time on Earth is limited after all. We can only choose to be certain things, to live certain experiences and to experience certain lives. And this is what makes this freedom so terrifying. Because most people don't want to be free, not in the ultimate meaning of freedom. Because true freedom is only one side of a two-sided coin. The other side is responsibility. Viktor Frankl, the founder of Logotherapy and an Auschwitz survivor, used to joke that he loves it that the US put up a statue of freedom on the east coast, but he liked to remark that they forgot to put up a huge statue of responsibility on the west coast. You know, we as people like the idea of being free, but we ain't like being responsible much. But true freedom always means to reject something for another thing. You know, if there's only one thing to choose from, it ain't much of a thing choosing after all. But if there are several options, then choosing one always means rejecting the others. And since we are mortal, we only get to make a certain amount of decisions. We will never know how our lives would have turned out if we had chosen lasagna instead of Pizza Hawaii, or if we had pursued our dream of becoming a pearl diver instead of studying law. We are responsible for choices, and this responsibility is something we as humans generally try to avoid. It's not uncommon for people to allow life to drag them into random directions just because they don't want to be responsible for what consequences a potential decision might have. I'm speaking from experience here on this matter and this matter alone I consider myself an expert but back to our little thought experiment see if we were to embrace our own mortality and if we were to accept our own responsibility for freedom then 
At least according to Nietzsche, there is no God stopping us from taking a conscious look at all the possible things we could be and then to consciously decide which one we'd like to be. There are boundaries that are given to us by society, circumstance, politics and probably gravity as well. But within those boundaries, we're totally free to choose how we want to act, how we want to define ourselves, what we choose to value, what meaning we describe to our own lives, whom we spend time with, whatever we believe in, what actions we choose to take and whose ideas to accept. And we're free to change this at any time. There's no force in the universe preventing us from freely defining ourselves however we see fit. And that really, really sucks because it means we're responsible for our current self and that we are responsible for how our lives evolve going forward and being responsible ain't fun. Sartre calls this living authentically. So most of you probably know where we are headed. Just one small thing. To be clear here, this has nothing to do with faith. That's not an atheist versus theist thing. Sartre and Nietzsche were atheists, but there are well-known existentialists that were deeply faithful people. If you believe in God, those ideas do not contradict your belief. They just mean that you are responsible for your belief in God the same way I am responsible for what I eat for breakfast. You know, you still choose. It just means that religion is no get out of jail free card. It's no absolute system that someone else can give you any longer. If you believe the Bible to be the literal written word of God, you still choose how you interpret those words and are responsible for it. You can clearly see this in our own world, you know, European Catholics, American evangelists, the Russian Orthodox Church and Mormons all believe in the Bible, yet interpret it very differently. Just believing in the Bible isn't enough if you accept existentialist ideas. You still have to interpret your own faith and are responsible for the consequences of your belief. Cool. So here's a fun Sartre quote. The for itself, with which he means living conscious of our own freedom, in fact is nothing but the pure annihilation of the in itself, with which he means just existing without a purpose. It is like a hole in being at the heart of being. And with this, we can finally return to the dark hole of nothingness that we're standing in front of for a solid 10 minutes. See, as I understand Outer Wilds, us taking a plunge here is exactly what we just waffled about. At least in my understanding of Outer Wilds subtext, us jumping into the eye is us confronting us with our own freedom and our responsibility for it in the face of our own mortality. A terrifying walk up to this plunge symbolizes all the anxiety and the angst that comes with being truly responsible for our own lives. And the eye, well, the eye. So Solonum says something very interesting about the nature of the eye of the universe. When we ask her on the quantum moon what the eye is all about, she says the following. There's fundamental uncertainty throughout the universe. Normally, this uncertainty is only observable on a very small scale. As one approaches the eye, however, that uncertainty grows enormously. Conscious observation forces a quantum object to collapse to a single possibility. But what would happen if a conscious observer somehow entered the eye itself? The eye of the universe is literally maximum uncertainty. It is like super, super precision. It is every possible version of everything at once. So when we take the plunge here, we consciously observe every possible possibility. Metaphorically, we are consciously observing what we could possibly be. And by doing so, we are collapsing all our possible selves into a single new one. It's all a metaphor for ourselves. More on that in a second. By jumping into the void, we kill what we thought we are, how we defined ourselves and what we valued so far. And from the resulting darkness, we create a new version of ourselves that is then being born. Gentle ladies, gentlemen and gentle people in general, please tighten the seat belts and take a deep breath. It is time for us to finally take the plunge. It is time for us to embrace the nothingness beyond. You're here for the game, for the art, for the endlessly spiraling sense of pointlessness and despair. The very first thing we see after taking a jump is the eye pulsing while we fall towards the center. Then we suddenly see hundreds of such vortexes carrying holes through reality in an image that kind of resembles a cave system or maybe even the synapses of a brain. We fall and fall and then all of a sudden we land in the very museum where the game began. But something is different this time. The descriptions of the exhibits have changed. Everything is written in the past tense now. The sun is described as already having collapsed. The gnomized technology is referred to the thing that allowed us to reach the eye of the universe. And the anglerfish are described as the creature we will miss the least after the ongoing death of the universe. And on the second layer, in the room in which we found the launch codes many, many hours earlier, we see a model of our galaxy with which we can interact. Interestingly, the interact prompt 
where it says observe here. So we observe and then this happens. Beginning from the eye of the universe, we observe an ever-growing part of the entire universe, solar systems at first, then our entire galaxy, as our own galaxy fades to nothing. More and more galaxies appear, they come to a halt, and we can fly towards them. Suddenly, we hear crickets chirping. We land in a small forest. All the galaxies are small lights floating around in the woods. We take a walk amidst this beautiful sight. And then all of a sudden, the galaxies start to dissolve. Slowly, all the galaxies fade away until there is not a single one left. Now we stand in complete darkness. And then, one of the most curious sequences of the entire game plays out. This sequence is the reason why I believe that the story of Outer Wilds is not only meant to be understood as it literally takes place, but also as a metaphor for ourselves. We stand in the darkness, there is nothing around us but a few quantum stones remembering us of uncertainty. And then suddenly, we receive an unidentified signal in the darkness. There is absolutely nothing around us but this unidentified signal. So we follow it and it leads us to ourselves. Once there is nothing left, once there is only complete and utter emptiness, we are suddenly able to receive a signal that our literal self is emitting. The metaphor here should be obvious because, well, because there isn't much of a metaphor left at this point, is there? It's literally us searching for ourselves and ourselves trying to find us. We are only able to receive the signal that we ourselves are broadcasting, the signal that leads us to ourselves once there is nothing left. So what happens when we reach ourself? Well, our self suddenly transforms into a tree. So I'm not going to do the whole Buddhist enlightenment confronting our own reflection body tree thingy again, since you know, we just did that in the Majora's Mask video, but it's certainly curious that Outer Wilds is a never ending circle of death and rebirth that ends with us confronting our own reflection under a tree, the exact same thing that the Shadow Link fight in Ocarina of Time represents. So what happens to the tree that formed out of our self? Well, it slowly dies, which you know, probably symbolizes letting our idea of our self slowly die. And then the remains of our own own self form a campfire and it is around those remains of our former self that we now build something new upon. The following sequence of the ending is in my humble opinion the most interesting one of the entire thing. We gather all our friends around the campfire. Once again all of this carries meaning on two different layers. On the one hand it is a reflection of our journey so far that has us gathering our friends to celebrate the ending of the universe and the beginning of something new. But on the other hand it is also a pretty hefty metaphor for overcoming our own struggles and rearranging our idea of our own self into something new and more harmonic. So let's first chat about the reflection thingy. We light the campfire and Esker is the first to appear. We are in the forest again. Suddenly we receive different signals. The first signal we follow is Rebex Banjo. If you recall the very beginning of this video, approximately 14.3 billion years ago, we had a quick discussion about Rebex's character. Rebex wished to see the wonders of the past, but was too afraid to actually get up and seek them out. The signal leads us to an old Noma ruin. This ruin has literally no entrance. It is a building from the past that entraps Rebex Banjo in it. Rebex is quite literally trapped in the past. But whenever we blink, the structure slowly crumbles, little at first, but then more and more, until barely anything of the building is left and we are finally able to reach Rebex Banjo, which gathers them around the fireplace. This reflects our own journey a bit. You know, we were only able to reach the eye of the universe because of the Nomai's past, and we dug up the secrets that were hidden within those ruins. The next signal we receive is Gabriel's flute. Gabriel is the other Harfian, who is aware that they are trapped in a time loop. They are also the one who taught us how to meditate. The signal leads us to signs that recite a poem that we encountered earlier. The quiet shade across old bark, in the ancient glades it's always dark. The final sign points us to the top of the tree. Up there we find a hammock, similar to the one in which Gabro meditated on Shine's Deep. In the hammock we find the flute, which gathers Gabro around the fireplace. This sequence also reflects our own journey so far a bit. You know, we reach Gabro by following written signs, the same way we reach the eye of the universe, by following the writings of the Nomai, which guided us. The poem also has an interesting property. It makes sense in every possible arrangement, which kind of mirrors that we encounter remains of the Nomai 
why in random order that all led us towards other clues and in the end formed a cohesive narrative, independent of the order in which we encountered them. The next signal we follow is Solanum's piano. That one is really interesting, because its symbolism is super obvious. Solanum is the Nomai that is still partly alive on the quantum moon. Her signal leads us to a tree stump with several dead Nomais around. Those Nomais are all looking upwards, trying to reach something in the sky. Whenever we blink, one dead Nomai hops onto the shoulder of the next one, building an ever-growing tower trying to reach the sky. And then all of a sudden, the skeletons disappear and in their place, a rocket appears. A rocket that we can now ride to reach the place in space that the Nomai were trying to reach. There we find Solanum's mask. The symbolism is pretty straightforward here, isn't it? It's all the generations of the Nomai that stand on the shoulders of the previous one. Each generation of Nomai coming closer to reaching the eye, but none of them reaching it. We are now standing on their shoulders, which is why we are able to reach what they died trying to reach. The next signal is Feldspar's harmonica. Feldspar is the Nomai stranded in Dark Bramble, the baddest one, the one afraid of nothing. We follow the signal and suddenly, a freaking anglerfish appears out of nowhere and tries to eat us, which almost gave me a heart attack my first time through. The fish disappears as fast as it appeared and behind it we already find Feldspar's harmonica. Once again the sequence echoes a part of our own journey to get here. Here it is overcoming our own fear to reach this place in the first place. And with this there's only one Harfian left to gather, Chert. Chert is the Harfian playing the drums, the one we encountered on the Amber Twin who felt as if they were the only ones interested in doing any science at all. They are the ones truly interested in discovering something new. And the way we get Chert to join us at the campfire is the weirdest one of them all. See, we find a projector that projects several suns right in front of us. If we get closer to the suns, they disappear. One of the suns has Chert's drums orbiting around it. The only way to grab those drums is by pulling out our signal scope, zooming in on the drums, because for whatever reason, we are then suddenly able to grab them. So we have to stop here for a second to really emphasize how weird this is. The zoom function was never mandatory to use at any point of the game before. Most people probably have forgotten that it exists by this point. I certainly have. You know, they basically introduce a brand new game mechanic during the literal ending of the game without a tutorial. Why would they do that? That's actually a rhetorical question. I have a pretty good theory on why they do that, but more on that once we get to discuss the subtext of what's going on. Cool, with church drums scattered, everyone is at the campfire. Now we can ask them to play their instruments. One by one, they all start to play. The song fills the darkness. Solonum says, a conscious observer has entered the eye. I wonder what happens now. And then a small sphere forms above the campfire. But what is really interesting about this sphere is how it forms. You see, it forms out of the campfire's smoke. The campfire is our remains. The sphere literally forms out of the remains of our self, which brings us to the subtext of the ending. Let's go through the entire sequence up to this point again. At first, we follow a terrifying path that leads us to the eye, a hole in the center of being. I believe this path is meant to represent our own struggle to accept our own freedom and all the responsibility that comes from it. The eye itself represents us accepting our mortality, the absurdity of life and the fact that our lives have no inherent meaning other than the ones we give them. Jumping into the eye represents us accepting our freedom to create ourselves as whatever we want to be. And then we land in the museum. The museum symbolizes us mourning parts of ourselves that we let go. You know, whenever we choose to be one thing, we neglect another. We give up something that we were or that we could have been. We allow something to die. I believe this is what the museum represents. We have let go of what was. And here in the museum, we now take a look at the things that were from a distance. It represents us looking at what we were in the past but are no longer. Next, we observe the galaxies. Metaphorically, we observe everything that is. And then there is darkness. Our self searches for us and we search for ourself. We are only able to find it now that there is nothing of ourselves left. Only in the absolute void we can hear the signal that we self are broadcasting, the signal that leads us to ourselves, metaphorically our true self. And once we reach ourself, 
it turns into a tree, it dies, and from the ashes of our self, we light a new fire. We now gather the music instruments. And gathering those music instruments is really interesting. Because I believe each one of those instruments represents a part of us that was in disarray. What we are doing here is putting parts of us together to a new harmonic self. We gather pieces of ourselves around our own death site, the campfire. And this is where the sphere comes into play again. This sphere now forms out of the smoke that our own remains emit. It's the smoke of the campfire that creates the sphere. Metaphorically, we let go of what we were, gathered new things that we want to be, and summoned those things around the grave of our old self. And now, out of the remains of this gone self, the sphere forms. Once we jump into the sphere, we materialize as a new form of ourself. The eye represents uncertainty. By entering it, we observe the uncertainty. By observing this, the uncertainty collapses into one of its probabilities. It's, you know, a quantum physics metaphor. But in the subtext of Outer Wilds, the eye does not collapse into a random possibility. We are forming it here. What Outer Wilds is saying in its subtext, at least as I see it, is that by confronting ourselves with all that we can possibly be, we become free to become whatever version of ourselves we want to be. As I understand the game, one of its core messages is to be a conscious observer of one's own self and to be aware that we can metaphorically kill the self that we are at every time and replace it with any other. It's the existence precedes essence finger machine. It's a message of empowerment. It's a message of ultimate freedom. That's the good news. The bad news is that we are responsible for that. Ultimate freedom is the terrifying kind of freedom. The one that comes with the fact that we are fully responsible for our actions and our lives. The one that comes with realizing that there is nothing forcing us to be what we are, but ourselves. It's the kind of freedom that makes us realize that our time is limited, our actions will be forgotten, and that all we will ever be is what we choose to do with our lives. And no one can tell us what this is. No morals, no society, no religion, no other people, no philosophy, no political movement, not even a fuzzy, can define who you ultimately are. You can define beauty for yourself. You can choose how much you value, status and money. You can choose whom you think trustworthy. You can decide your career for yourself. You're free to love whomever you want. You're free to define yourself as you wish, your identity, your gender, whom you spend time with and whose religion you believe in. If nothing matters and we are all going to die anyway, then we are ultimately free. If we accept life to be ultimately meaningless, Besides the meaning, we give it ourselves, then we're truly free to be whatever we are. We're also free to cause chaos, to hurt ourselves and other people, and to bring pain and suffering into the world. But, you know, why would we choose to do so if we're instead free to arrange the different pieces of ourselves into a melodic harmony that sounds this beautiful? But all of this leaves us with a question. If we're truly free to put whatever we want into the center of our being, then it begs the question, what to put there? <laughs> you know, are there core beliefs and values that are better to adhere to than others? Are there some ideas that are universally a good idea to live by for everyone? And at least in my interpretation, Outer Wilds actually makes very subtle suggestions as to what some good values are to put into the center of ourself. Because we literally put five ideas into the center of ourself during the ending, don't we? The five instruments that the five Harfians play. The five instruments that together form the harmonic song. The song that plays before the sphere starts to pulsate and everything becomes dark. Metaphorically, we get to talk to those five ideas that we gathered around the death side of our old self, that we put close to the core of our new self. Here is what they have to say. Rebeck says, I learned a lot by the end of everything. The past is past. Now. But that's, you know, that's okay. It's never really gone completely. The future is always built on the past, even if we won't get to see it. Still, it's um, time for something new now. 
Rebecca's story is the story of them becoming trapped because they were seeking out the past. The part of our new self that Rebecca represents is originally entrapped in a building from the past that has no doors. But during the ending, this building crumbles to dust and now Rebecca is okay that the past is in the past. Here's what Cher tells us. Even if it's over now, I had a good time learning, but I think the rules are about to change. Cher's character is defined by his intellectual curiosity and by his willingness to learn. Here is the little guy, at the very end of everything, happy that they got to learn so much. Which brings us to the sequence in which we got our church's instrument, the really weird puzzle thingy, where we have to pull out the signal scope zoom function, even though we never needed it before. See, what we are doing there is discovering something new. We learn about a new way to interact with the game that never appeared before. We are literally learning something. And this is the second idea that we put close to the core of our next self. Then there is Esker. Esker is interesting in that they are already here. We do not have to find them. Here's what they say. Wow, how long has it been since I got to make music with everyone around the campfire? I am really happy we are all here. Eska is just grateful for being here. Esker, the Harfian that is just here, without us doing anything, turns out to be grateful for just being here. The third idea, close to the center of our next self. Which brings us to Feldspar, the Harfian that made it past the anglerfish. Here's what they have to say. You cut it a little close, don't you think? Well, it worked out all right in the end, I suppose. Ah, I hope there are beasties in the next one. At the very end of everything, Feldspar wishes that there are monsters to confront, whatever comes next. We gather his instrument by confronting an anglerfish, which, you know, symbolizes us facing our fears. So a willingness to confront monsters and our fears is the fourth thing we place close to the core of our new self. Then there's Solanum. She's a bit of the odd one out here. She doesn't really represent an idea, but more of a guide that leads us through the whole procedure. Here's what she has to say. I believe we've reached the end of our journey. All that remains is to collapse the innumerable possibilities before us. Are you ready to learn what comes next? I believe Solanum represents that other people are able to help us find ourselves and in turn that we are also able to help others find themselves. She's also a bit of an outlier here since she's the only one present who has a defined gender. And this leaves us only with one Harfian, Gabro. Here's what Gabro has to say. I tell you what, this has been really fun and I got to help make something pretty cool, so I've got no complaints. I mean, not me exactly, but close enough. It's the kind of thing that makes you glad you stopped and smelled the pine trees along the way, you know? Gabro is glad that they stopped and took in their surroundings every once in a while. They represent mindfulness of our surroundings. You know, Gabro literally teaches us how to meditate. And that's it. Those are the five ideas that Outer Wilds puts close to the center of our next self before we are symbolically reborn into a new version of us. Those are the ideas that the instruments in the song represent. During most of the game, this song is out there, somewhere in the solar system, and we are able to hear the instruments if we search for them and listen closely, but they are in disarray. The instruments or ideas are also spread over planets that have a symbolic similarity with repression mechanisms of the self. Though, I honestly believe that's probably just a lucky coincidence. By the end of the game, however, those ideas are in harmony with each other and close to the core of our new being. Outer Wilds confronts us with the terror of our own freedom, shows us our capability to change ourselves at will, and then it puts five core ideas or values close to what's to come. Five very simple core values are at the center of our next self during the ending of Outer Wilds, namely mindfulness, gratefulness, a willingness to learn, not allowing the past to consume us, and seeking to confront our fears. That's it. And you know, maybe, maybe that's actually enough. Maybe that's all that it takes to live a meaningful life. Otto Wilds is, at least to me, an existentialist masterpiece. Throughout the video, we echoed a lot of media that explores existentialist ideas, and all of those games referenced are masterpieces in my opinion. Exploring existentialist ideas is a bit like doping for the art apparently. But while there are tons of great pieces of media out there that all explore those ideas, at least in my opinion, 
none of them do it as well as Outer Wilds does. In my opinion, Outer Wilds not only deserves praise for what a great game it is, which it certainly is, but it also deserves praise for how it allows us to experience some of the most interesting philosophical ideas of our time. Outer Wilds is a wonderful video game, but it is even more than that. It is also an incredibly inspiring exploration of some of the deepest struggles of the human condition. And for this, I cannot praise the game enough. Hooray! And with this, we've reached the end of this little video. Would you believe it? We did it before our own sun exploded. So before we wrap this up, just a couple of things. So first, a huge and gigantic universe-spanning thank you to all my wonderful patrons whose names are currently scrolling by. Without their support, this video would not have been possible. A huge thanks for this. Second, there are a bunch of interesting things that I wanted to mention in the video, but that didn't fit. So. First, this here is a picture of the Helix Nebula, a planetary nebula in the constellation Aquarius. I believe they got the idea for an eye of the universe from this little nebula, for, well, reasons that are obvious to the eye, pun fully intended. Second, there is a phenomenon that scientists lovingly call GPMJ1839-10. So what is GPMJ1839-10? One might ask. Well, it's a radio signal that hits the Earth almost exactly every 1318 seconds. What is emitting the signal? Well, we aren't entirely sure as far as I understand it. It's very unusual. It's probably just an unusual magnetar, but I'm honestly not even remotely qualified to have an opinion on this. The reason I bring it up is a different one. 1318 seconds are almost exactly 22 minutes, the length of one cycle of Outer Wilds. I wonder if the length of the cycles was loosely inspired by this phenomenon. Also, I'm eternally sorry for every real-world quantum physicist or philosopher whom I probably sent into a deep existential crisis with all the errors that I probably made. Hooray! And with this, it's time for us to wrap this up. Thank you so much for watching this little video. I hope you get at least some entertainment and value out of it. If you liked it, liking it back would be a gentleman's move. If you're interested in more long-form content discussing games, subscribing might be a good idea. And if you truly love the video and want to ensure that content like this can survive on the platform, and there is also the option to support the channel via Patreon. Alright, thanks for watching, until next time. Lots of hugs.